Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. For those of you who may not know me, I am Richard Silver, Medical Director of the Cancer Research and Treatment Fund. Welcome to our 11th patient symposium on the monoperiphal neoplasms, also known as the NPNs. I emphasize 11th because we physicians recognized years ago that education is crucial to patient health. We know that our patients are less apprehensive about their illness when they are better informed. Therefore, we hope that today's symposium will leave you with the most up-to-date, scientifically-based information. We usually hold the patient symposium in conjunction with our International Myeloproliferative Neoplasm Congress, a professional education program. Our Congress is designed to feature interpersonal contact and discussion, which we could not do this year, obviously, because of COVID. I know that some of you come to the Congress and patients are always welcome. Hopefully, we will hold the next Congress in October 2021. I do wish to thank my hardworking partner, Dave Bully, who incidentally is treasurer of the Cancer Research and Treatment Fund. As the saying goes, he has a full-time volunteering job. Sometimes he squeezes in a round of golf and attends to his household duties when he has the time. Dave takes this symposium very seriously. First, he holds an organizational meeting with our patient committee who work with us to select the agenda. We are very grateful to the entire committee for their valuable input and commitment to their fellow patients. I also thank Barbara Rosenstein, CRT Director of Administration and Development for her diligent and hardworking effort pertaining to this meeting. I also thank my professional colleagues for their participation and for taking time from their very busy schedules to share this day with us. Now it is my pleasure to introduce one of our country's most distinguished cancer researchers who is so pleased to welcome you. Dr. Lewis C. Cantley is the director of the Sandrew and Edward Meyer Cancer Center at Wild Cornell Medicine. His pioneering research has resulted in revolutionary treatments for cancer diabetes, and autoimmune diseases. Welcome, Dr. Cantley. Welcome, everyone. It's uh, wonderful, once again, to be at uh, one of these symposiums on MPN. It's, uh, it's a disease that, uh, as all of you know, is uh, very difficult to manage, but we've discovered a lot about this disease over the last uh, 10 years or so. And this is leading to new possible ways to intervene uh, looking at the program today, we have really some fantastic speakers who are right at the cutting edge of understanding what's driving this disease and potentially new therapeutic interventions. So as head of the Meyer Cancer Center at Wild Cornell, it's, it's, uh, I'm very proud to have this uh, group of faculty working in this important disease. And I just... Uh, Welcome all of you to enjoy the day, and I think we're all going to learn a lot. Thank you very much. Good morning, and welcome to our first virtual MPN patient symposium. My name is Dave Bluley, and like many of you, I'm an MPN patient. It's also my privilege to be a member of the board of the symposium's primary sponsor, Cancer Research and Treatment Fund, and to serve as the patient committee chair for this symposium. The patient committee selected the topics we'll cover today. So we can say this symposium was designed by patients for patients. First, a little about you. We have over 250 attendees on the line from states across the US, including Hawaii, aloha, and 10 countries in Europe and Asia. The silver lining in doing a virtual presentation is that our reach is greater. Today's program would not be possible without the generous educational grants from our corporate sponsors. We are deeply grateful to our presenting sponsor, Insight Corporation, for their long association with this event and their commitment to patient education. Our sincere thanks also to Pharma Sencho for their loyal support of this symposium. Thanks also to our platinum sponsors, Bart and Milan Shah, and to the many other individual donors who have generously supported this event. 
And finally, we want to acknowledge Special Docs consultants who worked so hard to coordinate this event. Now a few housekeeping details. If you've joined us before, you'll see that we've tried to keep this virtual program as close as possible to our live symposium. We'll begin with a series of presentations on selected topics, followed by a general Q&A session for all the attendees. We'll then conclude with disease-specific breakout sessions in the afternoon. All of you received separate links to today's program. The first one, which you're using right now, gives you access to all of the presentations and the general Q&A, which will begin at 1245, following a short lunch break. If you leave the program at any point during this time frame, you can use the same link to return to it. The general Q&A session will give you an opportunity to submit questions for the panelists, the presenters you'll hear from today. We encourage you to click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen to send questions in writing to us throughout the day. This is a high-tech replacement for the index cards you have filled out in the live symposium. Dr. Silva will select questions and direct them to a panel member who will answer just as if we were together in person. We'll make every effort to answer as many questions as we can. The second link you received will connect you to a disease-specific breakout session, PV, ET, or MF, that you chose when you registered. And again, you'll type in your questions using the Q&A function, and the panelists will respond verbally to as many as possible. If you registered for more than one breakout session, please be sure to keep those links handy so you can switch back and forth between sessions. Finally, I want to mention that we'll be posting the presentations online. So you'll be able to catch up if you miss any part of the program or want to watch again. We'll send an email blast as soon as the online program is available. Thanks for joining us today. And now here's Dr. Silver to introduce our first speaker. Inflammation is a very important initiator of the myeloproliferative neoplasms. Our first speaker is Dr. Hans Hasselbach from Denmark, who will discuss this subject. Good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizers of this uh, uh, patient symposium for inviting me and giving me the opportunity uh, uh, to, uh, to talk on uh, uh, the issue today, inflammation and MPNs, clinical and therapeutic aspects. First of all, I, I would like to show you uh, the MPN inflammation model. The hypothesis being that chronic inflammation drives the malignant clone from the early uh, MPN cancer stage, uh, essential thrombocytemia, over towards polycythemia vera in DIAC2 positive patients to the advanced myelofibrosis stage. Actually, chronic inflammation in other inflama inflammatory diseases uh, gives rise to accelerated or premature atherosclerosis. In other chronic inflammatory diseases, uh, chronic inflammation also gives rise to, uh, el it may elicit uh, blood clots. And uh, several other cancers than MPNs are uh, preceded uh, by a chronic inflammatory state. Now, uh, let us uh, look at uh, the consequences and the perspectives of MPNs as a human inflammation model, as a human inflammation model for cancer development. And I will, the next uh, 20 minutes, give, uh, pick up some examples uh, of uh, uh, the consequences of chronic inflammation, and I will also uh, put in perspective uh, the importance of early intervention with a single drug in MPNs that targets the stem cell, uh, and that is interferon. And finally, I will uh, uh, briefly summarize uh, combination therapies and how I see the future uh, for patients with MPNs. First, uh, I would like first. I, I, I first. I would like to to uh, to 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 briefly um, um, focus upon a, a study by my by some of my Danish colleagues, uh, showing that uh, MPNs are associated with an increased risk of fractures. Uh, 
we believe that this may be due to inflammation mediated bone loss uh, giving rise to what we uh, call osteoporosis. Another important uh, uh, issue uh, is uh, development of chronic kidney disease in MPNs. Actually, let us try to imagine uh, another inflammatory syndrome, type 2 diabetes mellitus. We all know that elevated blood uh, glucose levels uh, may, during years make you rise to chronic nephropathy. Uh, we have shown that it, patients with MPN from early stage ET over PV to myelofibrosis are characterized by a, a decrease in, in kidney function in a subset of patients, actually delivering indirectly the proof of concept that chronic inflammation may also give rise to a chronic kidney disease in MPNs. Another important topic is uh, the fact that uh, uh, MPNs are associated with what we call drusen. Drusen is a precursor stage for age-related macular degeneration, uh, giving rise to uh, visual impairment in the elderly and a common cause of blindness. Uh, another uh, uh, class example of uh, the, the impact of chronic inflammation, you may take uh, this example that MPNs uh, are associated with inflammatory bowel disease. Hippocrates stated that all disease begins in the gut. Uh, Dick Silva and co-workers have shown uh, uh, in 2013 uh, for the first time that MPNs are associated with inflammatory bowel diseases. The implication of this pilot study might be that you uh, uh, have a high risk of, uh, of suspicion of MPNs amongst patients with inflammatory bowel diseases which are featured by elevated uh, white blood cell counts and elevated uh, uh, platelets as well. We have confirmed uh, the observations by uh, Silva and uh, his group uh, in a most recent national registry study confirming that uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, bowel diseases are associated uh, with uh, MPNs. Another important fact is that MPNs are associated with an increased risk of second cancer. And this is not only before the MPN diagnosis, it is also after the MPN diagnosis. These cancers are amongst others skin cancers, but also urinary tract cancers and lung cancer. And I will come back to, to this later because uh, we have shown that smoking is a risk factor for MPN development and this in the context that that lung cancer is that patients with MPNs have an increased risk of second cancers it is it all sticks together. As I just told you Smoking is a risk factor for MPN development. And uh, this is rather novel information, but actually not that surprising when considering that other myelite uh, neoplasms, for instance, a neoplasm called myelodysplastic syndrome and also acute myeloid leukemia have been shown to be associated with smoking. What about uh, blood clot formation? Uh, is blood clot formation thrombosis? Uh, is, is thrombosis associated or can it be elicited by chronic inflammation? Barbwick and co-workers ha have clearly shown that there is a link between chronic inflammation and thrombosis in MPNs. Actually, uh, 
the DAC2 mutation per se promotes atherosclerosis and atherothrombosis. The DAC2 mutation, as I will sh uh, show you later, uh, is, uh, is, uh, uh, is emerging uh, uh, in elderly people, uh, and in some uh, it does no harm, in others it is a precursor for overdevelopment of MPN. And this is what we call age-related mutations, giving rise to uh, thrombogenesis, blood clot formation, and plaque inflammation, and ultimately uh, uh, eliciting an increased adult thrombotic risk. A very important message is that MPNs are not often diseases. They are not uh, rare diseases. They are actually massively underdiagnosed blood cancers. And we have shown this in blood last year, where when we screened 20,000 uh, Danish citizens, showing that about 645 uh, 40, uh, actually harbored uh, most of them the DAC2 mutation and uh, uh, about, uh, I think, 35 uh, citizens the CALA mutation. But the last majority harbored the DAC2 mutation. And since the DAC2 mutation is a thrombosis promoter is a risk factor for thrombosis in MPNs. These citizens are at a constant risk of life invalidating and life uh, threatening uh, thrombosis and sudden death. So it's important to emphasize that even in the chip phase, uh, when you have not uh, yet developed MPN, but in a precursor stage to the development of MPN, the DAC2 mutation promotes uh, thrombosis. What then might elicit over MPN development from the so-called chip phase? Try to imagine that this is a time span of 10, 15 years. Uh, what are the determinant factors? That is a research uh, 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 field in our MPN consortium where we try to now to uh, uh, elucidate the factors and isolate the factors that might drive the chip citizens towards over MPN. Thereby we will have a, a unique opportunity to, uh, to attack uh, the cancer in the earliest uh, uh, disease stage possible. It might be chronic inflammation, for instance, smoking. It might be additional mutations, for instance, the tattoo mutation. It might be other chronic inflammatory diseases, smoking, etc. Treatment goals in the future. What are we to target? Uh, we have to target the malignant clone by targeted stem cell therapy, and I will come back to this later, namely interferon alpha-2. But we also have to target the concurrent inflammatory state and the inflammation-mediated comorbidities. We have to quell the fire in the early disease stage, thereby prohibiting clonal evolution and blood clot formation. Early intervention, when the chance of quelling the fire is the very best. Here we have to stop the fuel supply, and I believe that we can do this by interferon alpha-2, targeting the stem cell. And adding to this, in the future, we should perform studies adding anti-inflammatory agents, for instance, JAK12 inhibitor, or statins, which I will address later. Interferon. Interferon is a draft horse. It works hard and it is a long, tough pull. When you start interferon, you will have normalization of blood counts within uh, weeks to months, but uh, to uh, induce minimal residual disease with uh, with a normal bone marrow uh, 
uh, it takes years, up to five to seven years with monotherapy. The only agent that is able to uh, target the stem cell is interferon alpha-2. For instance, ruxolitinib or hydroxyurea do not target the stem cell directly. We have shown by data-driven analysis of the DEC2 kinetics, kinetics during interferon alpha-2 treatment of PV patients and, uh, and, and ET patients that the earlier you treat with interferon alpha-2, the shorter is the time period that you have to treat, in, in, implying that when you treat at the earliest uh, time point possible, after diagnosis, then you only have to treat for a few years, but if you uh, 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 post postpone uh, uh, the time point and watch and wait for years, then uh, allowing the DEC2 a little burden to increase to 60, 70, 80, 90, then you have to treat for many years before you are able to induce minimal residual disease. We have shown this, uh, this is the first patient to the left uh, being treated with interferon alpha-2 and, and showing minimal residual disease with normalization of the bone marrow after about five to six years of monotherapy with interferon alpha. In this time period, uh, we observed a gradual decline in the textual little burden to uh, below one percentage, and even in a time period with uh, uh, undetectable DAC2. And then we paused interferon, and two or three years elapsed with totally normal blood counts. And then the patient uh, again began to climb up in DAC2, but still with normal cell counts. And then I reintroduced, reinstalled interferon alpha and the DEC2 allele burden again declined. That is personalized medicine uh, and a class example how we can, by using interferon alpha, totally control the disease and monitor the disease activity at the molecular level uh, by DEC2 uh, measurements serially. We have uh, then tried to develop the concept by adding uh, combination therapy with ruxolitinib, thereby uh, uh, calming the fire, uh, 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 extinguishing the fire, uh, the driving force, the information for clonal evolution. Before I come back to ruxo and uh, uh, interferon, I will just say a few words about statins. As you may know, statins are not only cholesterol-lowering agents. They are very potent anti-inflammatory agents. And actually, some authorities claim that they are also anti-cancer agents. Then you may ask the question, are statins able to improve response to interferon alpha? If you uh, go back in history, looking at the literature on statin therapy together with interferon alpha in hepatitis patients, the answer is yes. Statin therapy improves response to interferon alpha, likely by decreasing inflammation, since inflammation impairs interferon sig signaling in the cell. We have uh, uh, addressed this about uh, 15 years ago in a review paper saying that statins may be an antithrombotic and cytoreductive agent in MPNs. Hopefully, hopefully we'll be able next year to launch a study uh, uh, proving uh, this concept. Uh, a few years ago, uh, 
a Danish research group showed in New England Journal of Medicine that statin use is associated with a reduced cancer-related mortality, just being yet another reason to use statins in MPNs who are associated with an increased risk of second cancers, as I have previously addressed. Then back to ruxolitinib. Ruxolitinib is not an agent that targets the stem cell, but it is a very potent anti-inflammatory agent, thereby uh, removing, uh, dampening the inflammatory, uh, the inflammation that drives the malignant clone. So this is a, a, the results from a paper uh, most recently published uh, from the response study showing that ruxolitinib, in a, at least in a subset of patients, reduces the DAC2 allele burden in patients with polycythemia vera. Uh, and uh, this uh, impact may actually be mainly explained by its anti-inflammatory potent potential. The question is if it is also anti-thrombotic. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, future studies will show that. But there are some prelimi preliminary data that uh, uh, also supports uh, uh, this viewpoint. All this gave rise to uh, our thoughts on combination therapy, uh, combining uh, uh, the, the old horse in the circus, uh, interferon alpha-2 with another agent, uh, uh, ruxolitinib, and also statins uh, uh, in future studies, but first of all, we used interferon alpha-2 and ruxolitinib. If we did so, we thought that we might, able, we, we might, we might be able to, uh, to disrupt the vicious circle uh, and thereby the progression of MPN from the early disease stage to the advanced disease, disease stage. That is our hypothesis that we can disrupt the circle, the vicious circle, uh, by early treatment uh, with uh, interferon plus minus oxalitinib. This is uh, uh, Pia, uh, my first patient uh, being treated with oxalitinib and interferon alpha about six years ago now. Uh, she was referred to our outpatient clinic with huge uh, uh, enlargement of the spleen and refractory to uh, anacrylide, interferon monotherapy, and hydroxyurea. I then put Pia on combination therapy with interferon and ruxolitinib. And as you can see, she rapidly normalized her elevated cell counts and uh, very rapidly uh, uh, had a decrease in the, the two allele burden from 90 percentage uh, to below 20 in about a year. And that is a really rapid decline. This single clinical observation gave impetus to uh, set up a study in our department uh, when we treated 50 patients uh, being intolerant or all refractory to monotherapy with interferon. And we published 12 months data in cancer medicine a few years ago, and most recently uh, our 24 months data, uh, confirming that this combination therapy, I believe, is a, a very, very encouraging uh, treatment modality, which may uh, change the future for uh, MPN patients uh, uh, radically uh, uh, when uh, we, uh, of course, we have to perform studies uh, uh, confirming uh, these uh, uh, single arm studies. So I believe that the future is to start early treatment with interferon and uh, uh, launch studies where we uh, confirm uh, our and other studies, for instance, collagen studies in myelofibrosis patients on combination therapy with interferon and ruxolitinib, and then also consider the use of uh, statins uh, uh, in these patients.
the aim being to induce minimal residual disease. Because when we then have obtained minimal residual disease, we will have the optimal platform for vaccination strategies for, and vaccination studies and therapies. Morten Holmstrom, my previous PhD and now postdoc at National Cancer of Immune Therapy at Hallo Hospital, showed, has shown that both the actual the actual mutation and the color mutation, and in particular the color mutation, is highly immunogenic. These, this observation launched the first uh, vaccination trial uh, uh, in color positive patients, and we have uh, a year ago launched another uh, study where we use dual vaccinations in patients with uh, ET and PV. The perspectives, uh, what are the perspectives of all this? I believe that it is a profound change in clinical practice in the coming years by molecular screening of target populations at high risk of housing uh, the DEC2 mutation. Early molecular diagnosis of MPNs and early targeting of the malignant clone and the concurrent inflammation, I believe, are very important tools on the path towards minimal residual disease and cure. Early detection of MPNs by molecular screening of target populations with inflammatory diseases and persistent cytosis, and I have just listed uh, some of them here, and then early targeting of the malignant clone and concurrent inflammation, early intervention to target the malignant clone with interferon alpha and inflammation that drives the malignant clone here in ruxolitinib and statins. The goals being to induce minimal residual disease, operational cure, and ultimately cure a reduction in thromboembolic diseases, a reduction in cardiovascular and cerebrovascular diseases, a reduction in inflammation-mediated comorbidities, a reduction in socioeconomic MPN disease burden, a reduction in MPN disease burden, improved quality of life and improved survival. We have a lot of challenges, unmet needs and unsolved issues. I only now, will close my talk by, uh, uh, by focusing upon a few. I think that the most important one of them is that, these, that the MPNs are massively underdiagnosed. In Denmark, 10,000 citizens with undiagnosed MPN. These citizens, they are at a constant risk of life invalidating and life threatening complications with blood clots in several organs, brain, heart, lungs. And when they develop overt MPN, they have a significant risk of other cancers and other inflammatory diseases. And importantly, the above complications and associated diseases are actually prevalent five, 10, even 20 years before the MPN diagnosis. What are then the consequences of un undiagnosed MPNs? A huge health economic burden of undiagnosed cancer patients with a high risk of blood clots in the brain, heart, lungs, and elsewhere. A huge health economic burden of undiagnosed cancer patients with a highly significant risk of developing several comorbidities with organ failure dementia due to multiple blood clots in the brain, heart failure, chronic lung disease, chronic kidney disease, other chronic inflammatory diseases. A huge health economic burden of undiagnosed cancer patients with an increased risk of other cancers, which are also associated with an increased risk of cancer-associated blood clots. What are then the perspectives? And I again, put in perspective the early detection and treatment. Earlier diagnosed by molecular screening of high MPN risk populations, 
earlier treatment with stem cell targeted therapy interferon alpha 2 to induce minimal residual disease and cure by vaccination strategies. Earlier diagnosis and treatment of MPN associated comorbidities, including second cancers, decreased risk of blood clots, improved quality of life, and improved survival. The dream of the new horizon is minimal residual disease and cure. The future, I believe, looks bright for our lovely MPN family. Thank you for your attention. Molecular abnormalities in the MPNs have become a necessary aspect of understanding the disease. It is also a very complicated topic. Dr. Joseph Scandura will explain next generation sequencing, a method for determining these abnormalities in diagnosis and in treatment. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to uh, spend the next few minutes talking about next generation sequencing in the diagnosis and treatment of MPNs. And this is an area I know from clinical care that can cause both some confusion and anxiety. And I'm hoping at the end uh, that uh, it, neither of those uh, persist. And so making sense of the mutations that characterize MPNs, I want to first talk about what's a driver mutation, what do they do, how are mutations detected, what's a co-occurrent mutation, and how is the genetic information used in patient care, and what does it mean if the mutations change? So first, what is a mutation? You're not born with MPN mutations and you can't pass them on to your kids. Mutations happen in everyone's cell all the time. Most of the time, the mutations don't do anything bad. Mutations occur in genes that uh, aren't important, or the mutations don't change the gene's function, or most commonly, the, the cells with the mutation are going to die anyway, and so they don't matter. And that's uh, your skin cells constantly uh, flake off. Uh, those cells may or may not have a mutation in them, uh, and, but they, because they flake off, even if they were mutated, uh, it doesn't cause any problem. However, sometimes an important gene is mutated in an important cell. And in MPN mutations occurring in blood-forming stem cells are the problem uh, at the root of MPNs. So what's a driver mutation? Driver mutations have two important properties. They can initiate a malignancy and they can propagate the malignancy. And so MPN driver mutation occurring in a blood-forming stem cell can initiate an MPN. So it can trigger the, the start of an MPN and it can allow the MPN to propagate or to continue on. Uh, and they can even possibly drive MPN progression. So there are just a few MPN driver mutations. In fact, about 95% of MPNs are caused by mutation in one of just three genes, JAK2, CalR, or MIPL. And whereas, uh, whereas polycythemia vera, virtually all of the mutations are in just one JAK2 gene, in ET and MF, a uh, little over half of patients have a mutation in JAK2. The bulk of the remainder have one of a couple of different mutations in CalR. Uh, and then those uh, with neither mutation in CalR or JAK2 are uh, predominantly or most commonly uh, have mutations in MIPL. And there's a small subset that have none of these mutations identifiable. So what do MPN driver mutations do? Well, these mutations increase cytokine signals in blood forming cells. So what's a cytokine? It's a special kind of growth factor, and cytokines help regulate blood cell formation. So normally when a cytokine interacts with its receptor on a cell surface, uh, some of these receptors use JAK2 as a client, as a way to transmit that message into the cell so it can act on that signal. And normal JAK2 does that in a regulated way. It'll trigger a response in the cell. And if this is a blood forming cell, it might get the signal that says, okay, make exactly four red blood cells. Do something very precisely under very tight control. And that's the way hematopoiesis usually works. However, MPN driver mutations are kind of like rocket boosters to this uh, cytokine signaling system. And what they can do when this cytokine, which is not mutated, and the receptor uh, is acting through a mutated form, uh, then that can sort of accentuate uh, the signal so that the receiving cell is thinking it's getting a very strong signal, making say make lots and lots of red blood cells. And that's really the heart of these diseases. 
whereas this accentuated uh, cytokine signaling as received by the cell, it leads to the overproduction of blood cells and many of the consequences of these diseases. Normally, blood cell formation is really a very highly regulated process. In fact, it's very tightly controlled because just about 30,000 cells, so-called hematopoietic stem cells or blood-forming stem cells, are responsible for all the blood cell production throughout your life. And so you only are born with about 30,000, hopefully die with about 30,000. And in between, those blood cells are cranking out uh, those stem cells are cranking out blood cells every day of your life to keep up with daily losses. There's about 3 million cells that are uh, shorter lived than a stem cell, uh, but they have tremendous proliferative capacity in terms of giving rise to what are called precursors. Precursors uh, largely live in the bone marrow, and they're sort of the cells growing up to be a certain kind of blood cell. And they too are generally proliferating a lot. And then we produce blood cells that get released, obviously, into the blood. Uh, and every day of our lives, uh, we're producing about a trillion new blood cells to, uh, per day. And those include a variety of different kinds of infection-fighting white blood cells, platelets, which help prevent you from uh, bleeding, and red blood cells that carry the oxygen around in your blood. Put that in perspective, uh, Dr. Silver's uh, stem cells have produced about 30 quadrillion blood cells throughout his life which is why you know so much about blood. MPN driver mutations increase cytokine receptor signaling. And a lot of the receptors um, for important cytokines that regulate the pr production of uh, what are called myeloid cells, basically everything that's not a lymphoid cell, a B or T cell, uh, are regulated by uh, receptors for cytokines um, that often use JAK2 as a client, meaning part of their signaling uh, uh, message system. And so when you have those mutations, all of that signaling is accentuated by the mutation. MIPL and CALR, CALR actually works to accentuate MIPL signaling, and that's a subset uh, of, um, of cytokines that are involved in hematopoiesis, but MIPL plays a very important role and so this accentuated signaling is what drives the MPN phenotypes. So how are mutations detected? First, just a quick primer on what genes and DNA are, uh, and a reminder that mutations happen all the time. Disease is caused only when an important gene is mutated in an important cell, and MPN mutations occur in blood-forming stem cells. So your genes are encoded in your DNA. This gene code is a blueprint for the proteins that make you. And uh, so in a, every cell of your body, you have a nucleus, and in that nucleus is uh, all the DNA packaged into what are called chromosomes, and that's wound DNA uh, that allows it, you know, certain genes to be turned on and off. The underlying gene is a sequence of letters, the DNA code, uh, in stretches that are used by the cell to, to uh, produce a protein. So it, it encodes a protein. And this is the letter code that leads that gets turned into a protein code and that protein makes made and proteins do stuff. And so cytokines, the receptors, the signaling pathways all involve proteins. So what about uh, genes and DNA. So genes are actually segments of DNA that encode a protein, as I mentioned before. And in this uh, example, we have genes A, B, C, and D uh, interspersed through a stretch of DNA. Um, and each of these genes is made up of this letter code. Uh, it's sort of like this Velcro strip of uh, the DNA code that your body uses to um, uh, to, as a blueprint for proteins. And there are 3.1 billion of these letters in the code of the DNA in every one of our cells. And only about 1% of this DNA is used for the 30,000 genes uh, that we all have. So to give you a, a, an idea of how much DNA that is, if you were to take all the DNA in all the cells of your body, you could take that, stretch it out, and loop it around, lasso the, the uh, moon 3,000 times from Earth with the DNA just in your body. So DNA is not the whole story. 
Uh, so just as a uh, question, how similar is the DNA, it says muscles, it's supposed to say fat. How uh, similar is the DNA in your fat and in your brain? It's identical. All the cells in your body have the same DNA code. What's different is that the different kinds of cells express different genes. And so that's a, a topic I'm not going to talk about today, but the regulation and packaging of genes is important as well. But this is uh, perhaps the underlying reason why um, you know, people can be fatheads uh, because they, they share the same DNA. So how important can a single change in your DNA be? Well, you know, to put that in context, how similar do you think Justin Bieber's and Albert Einstein's DNA uh, is? And as for all humans, we're about 99% identical at the level of the DNA code. And so those little differences are what make us all, or contribute to what makes us all a little bit different. Um, and we're really pretty similar to monkeys too, which maybe is uh, in context with uh, Justin Bieber makes a little bit more sense. But you can see that uh, this 1.2% difference between humans and monkeys leads to dramatic phenotypic differences. And so how are mutations detected? How do you find a change in just one, perhaps, of the three billion letters of your genome? And so there's a couple different ways uh, to do that. One approach is to use a technique called PCR, and that's a, a technique I'm not gonna get into, but is a way of making many copies of a short piece of your DNA. And you can make enough copies that you can actually purify it and sequence it and look at the letter code with traditional methods. Uh, another uh, technique is qPCR or PCR that can amplify a specific piece of DNA, a mutated piece of DNA, but maybe not a normal piece of DNA. Um, and qPCR allows you to quantify that. And so that's a way of saying you have a certain amount of mutation compared to something else. Uh, sequencing is uh, traditionally done where you read a letter code um, through a variety of different techniques, but it tells you what are the letters in that sequence uh, of DNA in that short piece you collected. Next generation sequencing is in many ways the same, but where it differs is that instead of looking at a single piece of DNA at a time, it's a technique that allows you to look at millions and millions of pieces of DNA simultaneously and obtain sequencing for all of them at the same time. And these pieces can be from uh, the whole genome or, or many different genes uh, and allows you because you have many copies uh, sequenced, so many different strands of DNA sequence, you can actually quantify uh, how many of one type of DNA code versus another for the same region of your genome. So as an example, let's say we have the same genes A, B, C, and D. The first thing you do in an NGS panel is break up the DNA into small pieces, and then you use what are called baits uh, in one form or another. And this relies on this sort of um, Velcro-like quality of DNA, wherein the blue DNA bait really only has an affinity for the blue DNA uh, in your genome, and the green for the green and the red for the red. But the blue doesn't bring down or doesn't capture uh, the purple. And so you can use these baits to capture or track the, the regions of interest. And then you can take each of these captured pieces and obtain the letter code sequence of the DNA. And as an example for uh, gene C, in these six pieces that were captured, you can see three of them have a mutation and three of them don't. And so what you would get as a report is 50% of the copies have this mutation. And this is done for all of the genes or all the little stretches of DNA that you've decided to uh, evaluate in the NGS panel. And so what is a panel? So again, you know, NGS is a way of sequencing millions and millions of pieces of DNA uh, simultaneously. And these pieces can be from many different genes. And the genes that you're sequencing are what are called the panel. And so if we go back to our example, our panel was genes A, B, C, and D. We captured them, we sequenced them, we looked for variants, and these are you know, genes, uh, sequences that differ from the most common sequences of human. And then we find what these uh, variants are, 
and genes A and C had no variants. Gene B, 28% of the sequence strands had a variant, and gene D, 50% of them had a variant. And so this is what, when people talk about variant allele frequency, they're talking about how many of the copies of the gene have this mutation or variation uh, compared to all of the ones that were detected. So in MPNs, uh, the panels almost always include the driver genes, so JAK2, CALR, MIPL, and typically uh, uh, they include other genes that are commonly mutated in MPNs. These are less commonly mutated than the driver mutations, but they recur over and over and over again, and some of them have prognostic significance. And so this is an example of a report you would get from a commercial provider, and what it shows is that in this uh, the DNA that was sequenced, they identified a mutation in JAK2. This is the most common B617F mutation in JAK2. Um, and so that's our one of our NPN drivers. They also found this co-occurrent mutation in ASXL1. And this is a mutation that's uh, similar to a class of mutations that are found that disturb the function of this gene. And then there was another one in ERBB3, uh, which is a variant but it doesn't look like it's a uh, pathogenic one. It's probably a normal variant because one of the copies that you got from mom or dad uh, was not the, the most common sequence for this gene. And the other copy you got from your other parent uh, was the common one. So half of the, the one sequence had this variant, but it's just part of you. It's not uh, part of the disease. One of the things that you get from these uh, panels usually is the variant allele frequency for the mutations that get detected. And in this instance, we see 34% of the JAK2 gene sequences detected had this mutation in them. And so what does that mean? Well, we know that the, the proportion, um, the allelic frequency or the variant allele frequency for JAK2 tends to increase, it tends to be lowest in ET and highest in myelofibrosis. And if we look at this 34%, it kind of lands about here, and it's most common in patients with a phenotype of PV, and that's actually what this patient had, has, is uh, polycythemia vera. But you can also uh, appreciate that there's quite a bit of overlap, so that's not an absolute diagnosis. You need all the clinical findings, uh, but it is something that, um, uh, can point to or help support a diagnosis. Uh, and, you know, these panels often include many other genes with which we don't have as much knowledge about what to do with it. Um, but in this panel, is actually with more than 100 genes included uh, and were uh, sequenced, and these were the only mutations or variants found. So what is a co-occurrent mutation? Many patients with MPN have a driver mutation and co-occurrent mutations. And this is true for patients with JAK2 mutated, CALR mutated, MIPL mutated, and even with none of those mutations, you can usually find some uh, mutations and, and often more than one mutation in, in some of these commonly or recurrently mutated genes. In fact, about half of patients have at least one co-occurrent mutation. And there are many co-occurrent mutations in MPN, recurrent, these are recurrent, non-random mutations that are frequently found in MPN cells. The most common are in genes called TET2, ASXL1, DNMT3. And then you can look, there's a long tail of uh, mutations that occur with a frequency of like 1% to 3% uh, of patients. Um, and those, you know, because they're rare, because it's a rare disease, we often don't know as much about the clinical significance of all of these mutations. So how is the genetic information used in patient care? Well, NGS data or this uh, sequencing or genetic data can help uh, aid diagnosis. So it can identify an MPN. Sometimes uh, you find a mutation in a driver gene and that can kind of seal the deal as to what that this is the diagnosis of an MPN uh, as opposed to a reactive process, just abnormal blood counts responding to something else. Um, it can also point to a type of MPN. And, and uh, I alluded to early on, that the driver mutations in polycythemia vera are almost always JAK2. Uh, you really don't find CALR mutations in PV. So if you had somebody and you were entertaining a couple of different diagnoses or it wasn't clear and you see a CALR mutation, 
you're you're thinking that this might be um, polycythemia vera drops down significantly. And the driver mutation variant allele frequency might point to diagnosis as well. There's a higher variant allele frequency in, for instance, myelofibrosis fibrosis than in essential thrombocythemia. NGS data can also predict outcomes, so they've been used uh, for prognostic decision-making, um, and this can help uh, make treatment decisions. So for instance, a patient with very low risk may not need any treatment at all, or patients with very high risk may be considered for a bone marrow transplant earlier before they get sick. And uh, this can help provide guidance for patients. So it's really a point of conversation than an absolute decision maker. Uh, there are uh, predictive models that have been uh, found to be valuable. This is one used in uh, myelofibrosis called the MIPS-70+. Uh, and this is kind of a, has a variety of clinical factors as well as molecular factors that uh, all contribute to a point system. And so the absence of a certain kind of CalR mutation might give you a point or the presence of what are called high molecular risk uh, mutations. Um, or more than one of those can give you uh, additional points. And the higher the points you are, the prediction is the shorter the survival. Now, it's important to recognize that it, what's not shown here is there are wide error bars on here. So this is not an absolute prediction. You know, this is like the lottery. You know, if there's only five people in the lottery, you have a better chance of winning than if there's 50 million. Uh, but even if there's five people, you're not guaranteed to win. And then there's more complicated systems that have been uh, developed based solely on the genetic information or with some limited clinical information. And uh, these can be used in more than myofibrosis. Uh, and uh, this is a one-time genetic tool predicting the future. And you know it, it's interesting and it's clearly the direction uh, that uh, the science and, and treatment and prognostication is moving but these are, again, not absolute predictors for any individual person. They're a, a way of saying people like this tend to do that, but there's always exceptions. So what does it mean if, a, if the mutations change? So changes in a driver mutation, varying allele frequency, so a decrease. So these are really research uh, ideas, although they are thought to represent improvement. If you have a decrease in the variant allele frequency, it's thought that maybe the therapy is doing something good. Uh, an increase in the variant allele frequency uh, can make people think, well, maybe there's a loss of response to therapy or even the disease is beginning to progress. But these are not validated, so they really have to be considered research um, measures. And the same is true for changes in co-current mutation, whereas the identification of mutation might predict uh, the, the outcome in the long term, uh, the uh, disappearance of a lesion, it's not really known what that means. You might think that might improve prognosis, but that hasn't been validated. Or the uh, acquisition of a high molecular risk lesion might worsen prognosis, but again, that hasn't been fully validated yet. Just as an example, blood variant allele frequency will change with differential blood cell count. So usually these tests are done on whole blood or whole bone marrow, and that's a complex cellular mixture. And only some of those cells have DNA, only the white blood cells. And if you look in the blood, most of the white blood cells are actually what are called neutrophils, a certain type of white blood cell where the MPN mutations tend to aggregate. Uh, whereas 5% of them are monocytes, and about 20% are lymphocytes. Lymphocytes generally don't carry the MPN mutations. And so for this reason, when you see changes in the variant allele frequency, sometimes that's just representing changes in the proportion of neutrophils in the blood. And you can see that this is just hypothetical, but if you change the proportion of lymphocytes in the blood up and down, what you see, even though nothing has changed in any individual within the neutrophils, you can see the variant allele frequency can change quite dramatically. So those little changes are both common and hard to interpret. So what we've been working on is trying to track the competition of MPN normal uh, and uh, uh, cells in the blood forming cells identified from the blood. I'm not gonna get into this, but it is a way of trying to identify what's going on with the MC MPN cells within the stem and progenitor cells themselves so that we can figure out 
if treatments are working to try to get rid of those bad stem cells or if they're not. So take home message for today is NGS technology has outstripped clinical knowledge. We have a lot more data than we know what to do with. Uh, and this data is an opportunity for discussion with your caregiver. So this is, hey, I saw this, what does this mean? And they can provide you with some information uh, about that. Uh, don't drive yourself crazy about these results. No matter what it is, there's no guarantees. These are increasing or decreasing the risk, but none of these things are, are guarantees. But it is an important point for discussion uh, and can help guide therapy or guide therapy recommendations. And with time, NGS data will help identify patients most suited to certain therapies or approaches. And just remember, therapy is really getting better year over year in these diseases. And as this genetic information comes in and we have new therapies, we're gonna have to be able to tailor more and more to specific patients who are at risk. And I'm gonna end there. Uh, this is my information. I'm happy to, to uh, talk to anybody. Our new colleague in our division at Wild Cornell Medicine is Dr. Guy Abuzena. He has worked closely with me in evaluating the results of the treatment of polycythemia vera using interferon. He will now present some of our exciting new results. My name is Guy Abuzena. I'm an instructor in medicine at the Division of Hematology and Oncology at Wild Cornell Medicine. The uh, title of my talk today is Polycythemia Vera. Uh, we're going to be talking about where interferon prolongs myelofibrosis free and overall survival. Here are my disclosures, and we'll jump right into it by defining what is polycythemia vera. Now, PV is defined by an excess production of red blood cells driven by a JAK2 mutation. Uh, under normal circumstances, our bone marrow uh, makes uh, hematopoietic stem cells um, that are capable of differentiating uh, to red cells, white cells, and platelets. In polycythemia vera, uh, patients get a mutation in the JAK2 gene in a stem cell that leads to an overproduction of red cells, white cells, and platelets. This is primarily true for red cells. Um, and by definition, when we're making the diagnosis of PV, uh, we do require an elevated red cell uh, count or red cell parameters, along with the presence of a JAK2 mutation and a bone marrow biopsy that actually confirms uh, the presence of polycythemia vera in the bone marrow. Now, why is this important? The overproduction of uh, red cells particularly makes the blood more viscous in polycythemia vera, which uh, makes it easier to clot as the blood courses through uh, veins and, and even arteries sometimes. And that leads to thrombosis, uh, which is blood clots, um, and uh, that entails things like strokes and heart attacks. Uh, and in addition to that, bleeding can also occur, although a lot less frequently. And these are sort of the more short-term acute issues. And over the long term, the things that we do worry about in patients with uh, polycythemia vera is the uh, progression to myelofibrosis and potentially leukemia, although generally leukemia arises um, after myelofibrosis develops. And so with all these complications in mind, we ask ourselves, how does that affect the survival of patients with PV? And studies have shown uh, that the survival of PV patients is shorter than the general population. Uh, so so shown, in, uh, shown in green here in the survival curve, where you can see the survival probability on the y-axis and the number of years. Uh, in green is the survival of polycythemia vera patients compared to the general population of the black solid line. You can see that the median survival here is significantly lower at 13.7 years in polycythemia vera compared to about 28 in the general population. Now, mind you, this uh, study uh, had a median age of uh, PV diagnosis at 64 years. Uh, so these statistics may not necessarily apply to the younger uh, patients. So in order to prevent some of these complications that cause mortality, particularly thrombosis, uh, which is the more immediate and common issue, or at least has been for uh, you know, several decades, uh, the first line of treatment is generally phlebotomy, which is bloodletting, uh, 
Uh, and the purpose of that is to lower the red cell count uh, to a threshold where the risk of clotting is significantly lower. In addition to phlebotomy, uh, the national guidelines recommend a treatment that includes aspirin uh, for all patients, but also a treatment that is um, risk adapted uh, based on the patient's risk of developing thrombosis. So if you are low risk, and that means that you're under the age of 60 or never had a clot before, then management generally is restricted to phlebotomy and aspirin. Whereas if you're high risk, there is the uh, addition of a cytoreductive agent. Uh, cytoreductive means uh, cell reducing, uh, and that generally is hydroxyurea or interferon. But at Well Cornell, we ask ourselves two important questions. The first one is how can we optimize treatment of low risk patients before they become high risk? Uh, you know, it's important to assess for new clots as recommended by the guidelines, but we don't necessarily like to watch and wait for a clot to happen uh, before intervening. And the other question that we ask is, can we prevent myelofibrosis, which is the more long-term complication, uh, especially now that we have become better at preventing thrombosis than we used to, now we have to think about long-term. And so at Cornell, what we do is for low-risk patients, we consider interferon if patients are eligible. Um, and in high-risk patients, uh, instead of hydrea or interferon, we say interferon first or hydrea. And so why is that? That is because interferon is a disease-modifying drug, um, and that is agreed, agreed upon in the general, uh, the general consensus. Um, because there is an uh, abundance of data that shows patients treated with interferon who have marrow fibrosis, as shown here in the figure on the left, uh, with the coarse uh, reticulin staining in black, um, that patient being treated with interferon, you could see that the bone marrow has a significantly lower amount of reticulin fibrosis. And uh, other large studies have also uh, looked at what is the percentage of patients uh, on interferon who have a complete bone marrow response, meaning the bone marrow goes from looking like PV to essentially completely normal. And that CR rate is as high as 27% uh, after uh, several years of treatment with interferon. So in addition to that, interferon is a non teratogenic drug, meaning it is safe in pregnancy and it is non-leukemogenic uh, on the long run. So does what the important question now is, with all this in mind, does interferon actually improve survival outcomes? And uh, to answer that question, we performed a study at Well Cornell to compare the survival of PV patients treated with interferon to those treated with hydrea or phlebotomy only. Uh, and in our um, uh, medical records, we have uh, 470 uh, PV patients who were diagnosed between 1966 and 2019. Uh, and of those 470 patients, 133 were treated with phlebotomy only. Uh, 94 were treated uh, primarily with interferon as an initial therapy, uh, and 188 were treated with hydroxyurea as an initial therapy. The clinical features of this uh, population of PV patients at Well Cornell is shown here in this table. Um, some of the uh, things to note is that the median age of diagnosis here is 54. Uh, so this population of patients is uh, generally younger than the reported median age of diagnosis. Uh, but you can see that there is a balance between men and women, um, and there is a, about a 44% uh, of patients have high-risk PV when they were diagnosed. Next, we looked at the three different treatment groups to see how they compare to each other in terms of these uh, characteristics. And in an ideal scenario, we would be able to uh, control for all these features and, and uh, um, have the patients matched in terms of age, gender, and other factors. Uh, but the reality of, uh, of this kind of study is that we can really control for everything. So we must acknowledge that there are some differences between these groups, which we will take into account in our analysis uh, of survival eventually. But the main difference to note here is that interferon patients are uh, younger than the uh, phlebotomy or the hydrea patients. 
But if you uh, look down to the median follow-up, you see that uh, patients were followed for quite a long time uh, and you know, some up to 45 years. So that's one of the strengths of this study. So what was the myelofibrosis-free survival of our patients? Uh, and uh, shown here is the, uh, for the whole group, is the myelofibrosis-free survival, where the median is 23.8 years. But what we're interested in is what is uh, the myelofibrosis-free survival based on the treatment group. And uh, this figure here shows the interferon in red. Uh, as you can see, it is the highest of the three groups. Um, and the line that is drawn uh, at 20 years gives you an idea of what is the percentage of survival without myelofibrosis. And the interferon group is 85% compared to 59% uh, and 51% only for hydroxyurea and phlebotomy. So not only is this uh, better, uh, but that is actually significantly better even when accounting for uh, some of the risk factors uh, that affect longevity, including age uh, and thrombosis history. So while taking into account these risk factors, interferon uh, remains superior to phlebotomy alone, and as a matter of fact, hydroxyurea too is superior to phlebotomy uh, in terms of preventing the risk of uh, myelofibrosis. But as you can see by this hazard ratio, the lower the number here, the better. Um, and of course, the higher the number, that's just not good. So interferon uh, clearly is superior to both uh, uh, hydroxyurea and uh, phlebotomy alone. And so we looked at the bone marrow fibrosis, um, which is a little bit different than making the diagnosis of myelofibrosis, which requires other, um, uh, you know, uh, other uh, criteria. But looking at the bone marrow fibrosis grade, uh, what this figure shows here is that in the phlebotomy only group, the blue bars, they march on from zero to 36 to 62 to 74 percent. So when you let it be, uh, PV will progress to myelofibrosis. But when you do intervene with treatments such as uh, hydroxyurea even, there's a little bit of a reduction, but most importantly, interferon has the lowest uh, percentage of myelofibrosis over time. What about overall survival? Now this figure here is the survival for the uh, 470 patients. And what is shown here is a median overall survival of 26.7 years. That is significantly better than the 13.7 uh, previously reported. So we're ha very happy to see that, um, but we do have to keep in mind that our group of patients uh, has a median age of 54. So it is a younger group of patients, but definitely survival is a lot more encouraging. And then looking at the subgroups, uh, it appears that that is primarily driven by interferon because the survival curve for interferon is significantly higher than hydroxyurea or phlebotomy. And at 20 years, to put a number to that, the overall survival for patients on interferon is 95% compared to 63% for hydroxyurea and 57% for phlebotomy only. And in a multivariable analysis, uh, that remains true. Uh, interferon is significantly better, um, uh, even while correcting for age and other risk factors. What is also interesting is that the longer the time on interferon the patient is, the lower the myelofibrosis risk and the lower the mortality. So the first table here uh, is showing the multivariable analysis um, of myelofibrosis uh, risk. And the interferon group has a ratio of 0 0.9. Um, what that means is that the, uh, there's a 10% uh, myelofibrosis risk reduction per year of interferon. So the longer you are in interferon, generally, the better your odds are at not developing myelofibrosis. Um, however, that is not true for hydroxyurea, and it is not true for other treatments. It's only true for interferon. And that is also the case for overall survival, uh, where uh, there is an 8% mortality risk reduction per year of interferon treatment um, that is not true for hydroxyurea or other treatments as well. What about leukemia rates? Uh, overall, the rates of leukemia were low. Uh, there's only 18 of the 470 who developed it. That's about 4%. 
Um, but because this is sort of a long-term study that followed patients for a long time, it'd be good to look at what is the incidence per year, uh, and that is 0 0.34 um, per 100 patient years. That's roughly, you know, if you ask, what is my risk per year, it's 0 0.34%. Um, and uh, so that's low across the board. Uh, it is lower for interferon, but these numbers are too small to make you know, a uh, definitive claim that interferon uh, also reduces the risk of leukemia. Although one might argue that if it does reduce the risk of fibrosis, um, that, that could uh, potentially reduce the risk of transformation to leukemia. So it's important to recognize that not only is interferon effective, but it is also uh, safe and tolerable. Um, if we were to compare uh, the percentage of, of side effects uh, or the percentage of patients who stop interferon treatment due to side effects, we find that uh, only about 13% discontinue interferon for side effects throughout the study, whereas 16% have discontinued hydroxyurea uh, due to side effects. Uh, and then, you know, this table kind of summarizes what are these more common side effects that lead to stopping treatment. Uh, for interferon, it is generally musculoskeletal, uh, including, uh, you know, uh, muscle aches and uh, joint aches and constitutional symptoms like fatigue, uh, whereas hydroxyurea patients primarily discontinue uh, for uh, blood count abnormalities uh, and uh, often uh, skin ulcers. So in conclusion, uh, we believe interferon should be strongly considered in the initial treatment of PV. And why? Because it is associated with longer myelofibrosis-free and overall survival. Um, and so what we propose is that the national guidelines, uh, although it is important to recognize the risk of thrombosis and how to manage that, um, they should also incorporate uh, the overall risk of other complications, uh, including myelofibrosis, and therefore uh, adapt an approach where even low-risk patients are considered for interferon treatment because of its beneficial long-term effects. Um, and uh, also for high-risk patients to explore their elig patient's eligibility or candidacy for interferon uh, before considering hydroxyurea. Uh, so that, with that, I'll summarize that uh, PV patients are at risk of uh, thrombosis and myelofibrosis both of which shorten survival. Uh, interferon is a disease-modifying treatment uh, that we uh, find to prolong myelofibrosis-free and overall survival, and therefore the initial treatment of PV should include interferon for eligible patients, um, irrespective of their risk category. And uh, you know, we believe this is important uh, uh, for a practice change, and I, I think it's time for a practice change. Uh, with that, I will acknowledge uh, our group at Well Cornell and the Richard uh, Silver MPN Center. Of course, Dr. Silver, who has been the pioneer, uh, the leader of interferon uh, treatment in polycythemia vera for many years. Uh, and it turns out he has been doing the right thing all along. Uh, and then I would also like to thank my colleagues uh, and our research team uh, who put a lot of effort into uh, the study and also effort into treating patients every day and uh, giving them you know, longer, healthier lives.